uh, birding community science project that's coming up um, this weekend. And it runs from the 12th. So it starts on Friday the 12th and it runs through the 15th. And it's the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, and so the Great Backyard Bird Count is a really nice way to get involved with community science around birding because um, you only need to watch for 15 minutes. You can submit reports multiple times um, and um, it really gives you a chance to, to do birding on your own pace wherever you are and to co contribute to community science. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to just give um, a little bit more information about, about that. And let me just make sure I've got and sharing. And then I'll put it in present mode. There we go. So like I said, it's um, happening the 12th through the 15th and it's a collaboration between the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Audubon and Birds Canada. Um, it's, and like I said, it's, it's birding wherever you're at, um, which has really been very much a theme of the pandemic birding. There's so many more folks that are really um, noticing the birds right around them. Um, so that's, and that's a really, you don't even have to be outside. You're welcome to watch from the comfort of your own warm home at your feeders or, or out the window. Um, and the platform, so the, what's, What's great about this is that it's been going on over time. Um, scientists are able to access this data and take a look at changes in migration patterns, um, changes from year to year, and then look at longer, longer trends as well. Um, so like I said, 15 minutes is, is really the, the smallest amount of time that's required for um, participating in the backyard bird count. You can count for longer if you'd like. Um, and it's not just counting the number of different species, but also tracking how many of each individual species that you observe. Um, and here's a bit of information, um, and I don't, I have it on, um, on my view here, but um, eBird is the easiest platform for entering your data. Um, so you would need to, to have an account on eBird um, or on the Merlin Bird ID and submitting your site sightings on those platforms will get your data submitted um, to, for the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so when you get into eBird, it's, it's basically a three-step process. Um, the first thing they'll ask you to do is ask you where you are doing your birding. Um, and you can either, if you've already been using eBird, they'll, it will have all your locations listed there and you can choose that, or you can find it on the map. Um, by just navigating um, to an area and you can choose one of the hotspots or drop a pin on that map. Then once, uh, once you have told folks where you're birding, um, we've got to figure out when you're birding. So you're going to enter information about the date, the type of observation. So if you're sitting inside your house, that's going to be a stationary count. <laughs> if you're out walking about, that's a traveling count. Um, the incidental, it probably would not be used for the Great Backyard Bird Count. That's, that would be like if you're walking along and all of a sudden you saw, see a bald eagle and you weren't intending to be birding, um, that would just be um, when you would use that. Um, and the historical would also not be used for the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so you're going to enter how long, when you started, how long you're out, how far you traveled while you're birding if you're out there, and then how many of you were, were doing your birding. And then the third step in the process um, is um, entering how many of each bird you saw when you were out there. And with this yellow arrow here, you can jump to the species and then you'll just enter the number um, of those particular species that you cited. And it'll show up in a list here. When you are done with your list, you're, you're gonna go down to that bottom right corner. Say if you have a complete checklist and then go and submit it. And so it's just that easy. <laughs> um, so does anybody have questions? I'll stop sharing my screen here so I can see. Um, if, if, you, if you're familiar with the Zoom reactions, you're welcome to un unmute yourself to ask a question um, with your voice, or if you wanna raise your hand and ask in the chat, that's another option. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. It's a really great way to involve people who are new to birding. And you know, for, for people who have been birding quite a bit, um, it's a nice way to get the data in there. The question is, what if your bird is not on the list? It is on the list. 
happens. <laughs> Sometimes um, there's examples actually of eBird is pretty, um, like it, it's pretty smart. Like it knows what birds you should be seeing near you. And so if you enter a bird that they don't expect to be on the list, then it'll flag it and say, well, it's, is that really like, is that really what you saw there? So um, all the birds should be on the list in there. And it is a good, it's called the backyard bird count. And as Gwen said, you can, you can do the birding from your home, but you can submit more than one checklist. So you could submit a few 15 minutes from your home, but you could also go to your neighborhood park or you could go up Camel's Hump or anywhere you want. If the idea is each checklist is at least 15 minutes, but you can submit them over and over throughout those four days. And one thing too, I'm wondering about our question in the chat um, just checking your bird names and make sure your bird names um, are the most up-to-date name. There is often, not often, but there have been shifts in bird names. So if you're not seeing it, um, just check that that is the most up-to-date bird name. And so I just saw a question about whether the all lists submitted on eBird during those dates are automatically part of the Great Backyard Bird Account. And yes, that they are automatically part of the great factory bird count. Um, could I see a show of hands of folks who have participated in the great backyard bird count before? If you like, got at least one person there. I, I heard a question, Melissa, did you have a question? Oh, you had mentioned something there about Merlin. So if you input it into Merlin, does it show up or do you also have to input it into eList or eBird? It will also show up on, for the Great Backyard Bird Count if you input it in Merlin. So both, both platforms, eBird and Merlin, will automatically but count is, for the count. But, but Merlin doesn't typically, you don't, for your list, they don't, you don't input how many you've seen. I hmm? have never used Merlin. I don't know, have Debbie or Erin? No, I use Merlin a lot for ID help, but I don't use it for submitting. I always use eBird, so I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. Yeah, and mine's the same. When I've used Merlin, it's one individual that I'm trying to ID, and I know it can submit that one individual. I don't, off the top of my head, don't know if you can tell it, you know, if you saw multiple individuals. I'm not sure. Hmm. But I can write that no, down and we can find out. Another thing that's fun is after the Great Bar Backyard Bird Count, you can go to that same website and you can look at the results. And I know um, one of the questions that came up was what, how are, what are the most common birds in Vermont right now? And I'm not sure what the answer is. I have some guesses to that question, but I don't have an answer. But after the Great Backyard Bird Count, we can actually go look up that answer exactly. And I just dropped the, the link in the chat for the Great Backyard Bird Count website. So if you'd like to click on that link, it'll then you'll have it in your browser to, to be able to see later. Uh, and everything counts. So even if you're out looking at your birds and you only count two chickadees, like that still counts. Like that, that checklist is just as important as a checklist with lots and lots of birds. So, so don't, don't worry if you only see a few birds. Yeah, Tony, it's the absence of birds is is important data as well. So if you're just seeing the chickadees and you're not seeing the cardinals, that's um, that's important data for scientists. Um, Tony, I'm wondering if you were trying to chime in with a question, or maybe we're just picking up a little background sound. <clears throat> All right. Um, one of the things I know I am hoping I still have is right now I have lots and lots of red poles, both at home, common red poles, and and we have them at the museum. We don't often have red poles at the museum feeders for some reason. So I'm really looking forward to submitting a bunch of checklists just so I can count all my red poles over and over. I just had I, I was on a meeting earlier with Debbie and I got distracted out my window and I saw a single red pole on my on my uh, crab apple tree. And so I'm also hoping that I'll get to see red poles. Do you all see my screen? Can you see <laughs> the red poles here? 
They are so cute. And I had my first red poles. I just put up a feeder at um, my new house and I just had my first flock of red poles come in. My birds, my cats let me know that there were birds at the feeder. Um, they're indoor cats. Um, and there was a whole little group of them. So that's really exciting. And they were all on the thistle feeder. We put our Christmas tree out just outside the, the plate glass window door. And I put thistle seed on the branches of the of the tree and the red poles land on it and it makes my cat so happy. I put a special little box right by the door, right by the window so she can just sit in her box and watch all the red poles. We have a new dog and she is also very amused at watching the, the birds out the window. So <laughs> equal opportunity. So there, Deb, Debbie, could you put a picture of a hoary red pole up? Mm. So a hoary red pole is a, is a rarer bird. It's often seen in flocks with the common red poles. They're kind of hard to ID. They're lighter in color and they have no white under their tail feathers, right by, um, anyway, so if you're looking at a big flock of common red poles, if you see a, a slightly lighter one, look at it closely and it might be a hoary red pole, which is a, a rare bird. So as I was gonna say, one of the questions that came up was about, you know, species to look be on the look for um, right now. Um, so red poles are definitely one. Are there other species that you all are noticing um, lots of right now? Go ahead, Miriam. Uh, around here, we've been seeing some bluebirds lately. Where do you live? Saxons River, Vermont. I was just down in Salisbury, Vermont yesterday, and I saw six bluebirds at the feeder there, which was really fun because in Huntington, we don't get them very often in the winter, but it was so fun to see them against the snow. Mm -hmm. These haven't, weren't at any feeder. They just hang out in the trees and in the woods nearby. So nice to see the, the color. Um, I, this time of year, typically um, visit a, well, you know, normal year, um, visit friends in the Champlain Valley. And I'm always excited to see the bluebirds there because they're so bright blue, like against the snow and the sticks. And it's always like a shock of like, <gasps> bluebirds, yay. Um, we're also seeing some folks saying they're seeing lots of pine grosbeaks in Montpelier, um, large flock of robins hanging out right now. I don't know, you might, can we share your screen again and see what a pine grosbeak looks like? Here I have that. That's a, I have that up on my screen so I can pop that up. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a bird we don't see in Vermont every winter. So it's pretty exciting to see them. So there's the pine grosbeak, and it's when you say many, we don't see many other people seen them. Sorry, Gwen. Oh, I was uh, when you say we don't see them every winter. It's one of the winter eruptive species that comes down from the north um, when the food supplies are not um, consistent up there. So, and the female or immature is quite quite a bit different than the male. And there's another shot of the female miniature. I know Montpelier's Front Porch Forum for a while, because I'm also in Montpelier, had been um, lots of chatter about the gross beaks, which was really exciting. And lots of people in the community were reporting where they were seeing them. So Gwen mentioned um, about birds we don't normally see being eruptive. And so there are a lot of birds from the north, like the red poles and the pine gross beaks and a red cross bills, those type of birds that we don't see every winter. And as Gwen mentioned, if something happens to their food supply north of us, either lots of food or no food, they tend to come down this direction. And so it makes for a pretty exciting year. And this year really is counted as a, um, as a super flight year uh, for all these winter finches. So it's really exciting to see in the red poles and the pine grove beaks and and even birds like red-breasted nuthatches are considered eruptive. 
So I don't know, have many of you been seeing more red-breasted nuthatches than other years? So again, uh, we saw, let's see, I guess it was just a few weeks ago that the red-breasted nuthatches were coming to a feeder uh, on the campus where I live in Saxons River. And then uh, it was probably in December. So it was a while ago that we saw a flock of pine grosbeaks that were hanging out in the cemetery. Um, but I haven't seen them since then. And the nuthatches are, I mean, there, there are always red, nut, red breasted nuthatches in Vermont all year round. But the ones, some of the ones we're seeing this winter are coming from farther north. Another bird people have been seeing that's a winter eruptive is the crossbills, the red crossbills or the white wing crossbills. And again, you can see some of them on occasion all year round, but more of them are being seen this year. I haven't seen any of them. And the link that I just put in the chat um, is the winter finch forecast. So every year um, there is, actually the, the torch has been put passed for the person who does this forecast. Um, so this is the first year with a new uh, person on board with the forecast um, based on the, the food supply in the north. They make predictions about who's going to show up at our feeders here. So um, put that in there if you'd like to take a look at it. So um, related to bird species that folks are seeing now, we had a question submitted in advance um, about northern flickers. Um, and if that is a bird that we typically see this time of year in Vermont. And I'm gonna, I pulled up a range map actually, um, because this is a species that we do get in Vermont. Um, the northern flicker also um, is one that people, it's a woodpecker species, but people often are surprised because it will regularly be on the ground eating ants. People are like, what is that bird doing? It's so big, is it hurt? Um, but this is a species that's range is shifting north and will continue to shift north in the face of climate change. Um, so I'm actually on Audubon's online field guide, um, but there, as you go down to the bottom of those pages for each individual species, they have a um, climate forecast. So what will happen as climate um, increases and you can play with it a little bit to see, you know, okay, 1.5 degrees to three degrees. Um, and this is a species whose range is shifting. So right now in Vermont, um, well, my computer's gonna be really slow. Um, so the red represents range lost um, and the blue is range gained. So you can see they're being pushed up to the limit there. But currently the Northern Flicker is one where uh, Vermont, Southern Vermont is entirely in its year round range and Northern Vermont um, is within its, the edge of its, of its breeding range. So I'm not surprised that someone is seeing, especially depending on where they are in Vermont, um, Northern Flickers right now, but Gwen and Erin, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, and I was thinking about other, there was a question in advance about other birds that have been um, newly in Vermont. And another woodpecker that, um, that I've noticed in Burlington is the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, and that's a bird that is not, had, I wasn't familiar with because it wasn't in Vermont. Um, 10 years ago. And now I commonly see it every year in Vermont. Um, so, and again, and it might be a good one to share, Debbie, from the, can you, um, the climate. Do you still see my climate page or can you see the wood? No, we've gone, we've gone to a different page now. <laughs> <laughs> we can see everything you do. Right, let me pull up. So before, before our meeting, I was looking up and trying to think about what are the most common birds and how do you find that out. And I went back to the Christmas bird count data of one of the Christmas bird counts that I worked on, which was the Middlebury one. And on that one day in December, when we went out and counted all the birds in this 15 mile radius around Middlebury, we counted 91 red-bellied woodpeckers, which was the most 
red-bellied woodpeckers that have been found on that count day ever because as Gwen said you know 10 years ago it was really rare to get to see a red-bellied woodpecker. Yeah because you can see on their range map right here it's it's Vermont is not within their range and that's definitely and I, I'm not sure um, how how often these range maps are updated um, or when they were most recently updated um, but you can see on their it's on their climate map um, range being lost out here, but it's going to be moving moving north. Hope that is the, right. So you can see all those places just disappeared from their current map here. There's just a little bit on the Champlain Valley right now, um, but with the warming scenario, you see the range is extending quite a bit into the north. So we no, also got a question ahead of time um, so related about the species. Um, are, uh, how are bird per populations in Vermont doing this winter? Um, I was on a meeting this morning with um, Steve Hagenboo, who's Audubon Vermont's forester, and he was saying that he has not had any birds up at his feeder all winter. Um, and he, you know, being a good steward, he's cleaned his feeders, he got new seed. Sometimes birds are very picky, especially if your neighbors have seed up. So if you have old seed, they can be choosy sometimes. Um, so he made sure his feeders are clean, he's got new seed, but he's had no birds. Um, whereas my other colleague has had tons of birds all winter long. She says she's gone through bags and bags of seed. I know in Huntington for a while, there were folks posting on Front Porch Forum. I love the bird posts on Front Porch Forum. We're posting on Front Porch Forum. Um, where did the birds go? Like we aren't seeing as many numbers as we have, whereas other people are saying we're seeing tons and tons of numbers. Um, so Gwen or Erin, do either of you want to speak to that? Well, I looked up, I didn't, I wasn't quite sure where to look because I have the same thing, Debbie. I, my mom calls me almost every day and says, I had one bird or I have no birds today. And you know, what am I doing? And I say the same thing that Debbie said, well, let's check your feeders. Your neighbors might have really good food. She doesn't have a cat. So I know that's, that's not it. And I also have lots of birds at my feeder. So it doesn't help our conversation. Um, <laughs> but um, I went to the Christmas bird count again, just to see for that one day, what the difference was. And um, we counted, sorry, I was looking at my numbers. We counted on that one Christmas bird count, 17,000 individuals, which was, I think, very close to what is normally counted. So I don't really have a good handle of if anything drastically has changed. I mean, there's lots of threats to birds but whether or not overall there's some big thing this year versus last year, I don't know. Glenn, what about you? Well, when I think about um, birds and where whether they're showing up at feeders or not, um, I guess the story that I like to tell myself and which is actually true <laughs> is that if they're not at your feeder, most likely that means that they are finding um, food in natural areas. So um, you know, I'm a huge proponent of um, native plants for birds. So the more that you can be doing to, to get food out there that's you know, gonna be surviving no matter what the circumstances are with, with putting food out at feeders, um, the better and more resilient um, our bird populations can be. And Gwen, do you wanna share the resource that you, you've um, shared about native plants and how people can find um, great Absolutely, plants? Absolutely, yep. Because there's, there's so many plants, often we think of, when we think of gardening, we think of the summer and the flowers and, and the pollinators, but there are a lot of plants that really provide food in the winter. And of course, a good time to mention why it's good to have a messy garden, because sometimes, although you may look at your garden and just think those are stalks of plants, there may be insects hidden in those stalks that things like the chickadees and the downy woodpeckers can get right in there and eat them. So I just put uh, a link in the chat and I'm going to share my screen here for our native plants for birds on Audubon, the database. Um, and you can just 
go right in and into the database and um, depending on what what is in your yard now um, and it doesn't need to be I mean putting native plants um, you don't have to have your own yard you can work with your municipality to work in parks or schools um, or other public places to be involved um, but you know it makes makes a lot of sense to start by noticing what you have now and what is missing in terms of food resources from from that place you're looking to plant um, and so you can narrow it down by the type of plant you're looking for. Um, and this, this is a really good way to, to think about it is the kind of plant resources. And I really like that, that caterpillars is listed right in there because insects are the top for um, food that birds need, especially to raise young. Um, and then if you're looking for, to attract particular types of birds, you can search it in that way as well. Um, and the database is set up so it, it will generate a list um, that's specific to your zip code. And um, yeah, it's a really, it's a wonderful resource to explore and it's fun to, to work with it in the winter. Um, and something that's not, not so easy to see is this local resources tab right here. Um, I work with the database to make sure that there's local nurseries um, that are listed here. And so if you scroll down to the bottom of, the local, of that local resources tab, where to buy native plants near you, this, this list um, gets updated if, as people send me things. Um, so hopefully, and if you see anything, any nurseries missing from there, I'd love to, to have them up here. And as there's more demand from folks, then these places will carry more and more native plants. Thank you. I think that's such a great resource. Thank you. We have right outside my office window, there's a flowering crab apple and it, it keeps its fruit, you know, into November and December. And one time I looked out and I counted five rough grouse just Ooh, sitting there fun. eating all those little apples. I'm, pretty I'm speaking of crab apple, I'm looking at my front window right now and I have a crab apple tree that holds on to its fruit through the winter and there's six robins on it right now. It's just stripping it. <laughs> What it to get a, a good variety of, of birds at the feeders, what do you recommend for seed? I mean, currently I use you know the sunflower, uh, black oil sunflower, and I put suet out, and I get a lot of I like a lot of red poles and chickadees and woodpeckers. Is there something else that would bring in you know a different variety of birds for, for, for the feeder? Yeah, so um, they call it thistle. It's not technically a thistle, but nyer seed is another one. It's really, really small and you have to have a, um, cedar, a feeder specifically for it. Although I've seen clever hacks where people use um, like the fine mesh bags from um, veggies, but they also make, they call them thistle socks. And it's just a cloth bag with really fine holes in it. But that'll add a little bit of variety too. I know at the center we have the black oil, sunflower seeds, suet, and the thistle, and the finches love, love that thistle. So it's always nice, especially in March when I am so done with winter, um, to see the, the gold finches coming and being all over that and noticing that they're slowly changing into their brighter yellow feathers. So that will give you like a, a good variety. I feel like a nice uh, variety of species. The other thing to think about is the type of feeder you have the food in. So, um, you know, the standard tube feeder, um, which, you know, looks like a tube and I, um, we could put an image of that up, is great for perching birds. But if you have birds that like to feed on the ground, they make um, feeders that are shaped more like trays. Um, you can also consider um, if you live in a spot where you don't mind feeding a little bit of squirrels, if you have a squirrel issue, but casting seeds on the ground, or the seeds that other birds spill on the ground, you'll get some of those ground feeders to come up too. Um, and then of course, as we get into spring, adding, um, if you don't live in an area where bears are a problem. Um, so at my house um, and at uh, the Audubon Center, we follow the guidelines from Fish and Wildlife, just because our feeders are also right on our porch and we have had issues with bears. So generally, basically once the snow is gone, mid, 
to late March, we bring our feeders in. Um, but you could also add in the spring and summertime, add hummingbird feeders as well. And that'll attract some hummingbirds. Plus there's also fun spring and summertime feeders too. Like you could put up a jelly feeder. Um, you could slice an orange in half and tack it up to a tree. <laughs> um, some folks also will put out mealworms. Oh, oh, my great aunt used to do that for bluebirds. If you go to um, the Birds Vermont Museum website, you can link to our webcam and it faces our feeders. And you can see examples of all the feeders that Debbie just mentioned. And if you're just also in a mood where you're like upset because there's no birds at your feeder, you can just tune in to the Birds of Vermont <laughs> feeder cam. <laughs> I like that. And feel better about it. <laughs> There are a lot of birds there right now. The other thing to think about in your in your feeding station is water. Um, I have a, at my house. There's this little pond that just has flowing water in it, and I saw a number of the red poles going to that and drinking water. And I know a lot of people put out um, bird baths if there's no water in your neighborhood. And then this was mentioned too. Something I also did this morning to help with my bird feeder, and Erin said she did the same thing. Um, I just took my Christmas tree out, so I haven't decorated it with any feed yet. Um, but there was a there's a gap between my hedgerow and my feeder, so just putting something to give them cover, um, I'm hoping will increase the number of birds that are feeling bold to to shoot the gap <laughs> um, and shelter at my old Christmas tree. Question about suet, um, my. The suet that I've been buying is kind of uh, hard and mealy and you know they'll come and poke at it but it doesn't seem too enticing to them and then I was speaking with my brother who lives in Virginia and his suet is such that he can just put it in a warm place in a house and it softens up enough that he just spreads it on the bark of the trees and then all kinds of birds come he gets 20 different birds all perched on the bark in different places and chewing you know eating the suet what type of suet should you get? What mixture, all that kind of thing? Well, I wonder, is your brother um, buying, going to the butcher shop and getting suet? Because, okay. No, no, he says it's just some 80 cents a container, you know, cheap suet, but his melts easily. Because <laughs> um, traditionally, I mean, suet is something you could get from your butcher shop. It's the fat the rendered frat from around the kidneys. And I think it's specific of, it's specifically of cows. Um, so you could go that way. Just know that it will go rancid if it's not eaten. Um, I just get suet blocks from the feed store in town. Um, I have noticed that it seems like there are some flavors <laughs> that the birds prefer, but mine, it sounds like yours. They're just, you know, a pretty solid block. Um, that stays pretty firm, even, um, even in the warmer months, it stays pretty firm. Um, and, you know, I put it in a little suet cage. Um, I had someone try, they make suet, if squirrels are an issue, they make suet that has um, chili oil in it. And so that deters mammals. Mammals can taste spicy, birds can't. Um, so the birds in theory will still eat it. Although he said, the squirrels didn't really like it, but he found that the birds preferred the other flavors more. <laughs> so I'm not sure about that, but there are also recipes to make your own suet. Um, and if you're a vegetarian uh, and the idea of using real suet totally creeps you out, there are some online recipes um, to make your own suet style blocks that use everything from peanut butter um, to lard. I just put a link in the chat with a suet recipe right in there. We've done that where it's actually as a kid's activity is take, um, make some of them and use pine cones or just use um, onion bags and you make like a big ball of peanut butter and lard and bird seed and put it out. And it is it's a very messy, but it's still really fun. And if you did something like that and you made your own recipe, you could make it as soft and mushy as you want to spread on a tree. I have tried spreading peanut butter on a tree just to see. It, it didn't work that well for me. <laughs> it reminded me of in the summer, I tried to make a um, 
a concoction of stuff to bring moths to my house of like bananas and beer and it also didn't work that well but it was fun here at the museum we use suet all the time and um, we tend to get kind of the as basic one as you can without any of the fancy additives just you know like like Debbie said, it's what they have at the at the feed store. I'm curious if he's buying it. Does, is it bought in like a jar? Like it's or does it come in blocks? That's I'm curious now. I'm gonna have to look around and see if there are some other store um, options for different styles of suet. No, it's bought in a block, and then he just warms it up in his home uh, until it softens. After he said, after a few hours, it's soft enough that then he can. Um, smear it over the tree and then pack it in the gaps in the trees. Cool. That would be a fun experiment too, just to see some different bird behaviors, right? Right. Yeah. And he has some amazing photographs of the variety of birds that come to it. And they are totally fine being at, on the tree trunk at the same time with each other. Yeah. That's great. I haven't seen, I'd like to know if anybody in the group knows if there's any suet that comes in blocks that's not wrapped in plastic. I always feel like I use, there's just so much plastic used by feeding suet. Anybody? That would be a make your own kind of proposition. <laughs> I was just taking a look at the questions that we had in advance um, and I think we've We've hit most of them except for there was a question about how can high school students in Fairhaven get involved? Is there someone in the, in the chat today who's, who's with the Fairhaven high school students? And well, so, but I will address like any, any high school students anywhere. Um, we offer programs programming um, and things are a little different during COVID, um, but um, feel free to reach out to our education team about working directly with high schoolers. Um, and then there's community science projects that everyone can participate in, certainly the great backyard bird count we talked about. Um, we just wrapped up our midwinter eagle survey, but anytime that you see eagles, we'd really like to hear about that. Um, and that's on our page. Um, and, you know, like I was saying with native plants, this is a great time of year to be thinking about, especially for a school, thinking about what you can do to improve habitat um, around your school. So that's, um, those would be kind of my top recommendations. I don't know if Debbie or Erin, you had other ideas for those high school students or in Fairhaven or elsewhere? I know I'm gonna give a shout out. There were some students in Northfield in the fall who contacted us because the senior class was doing a project to improve their bird yard. Um, around the school. Well, it's not their bird yard. I called it their bird yard, but um, their yard and their grounds around the school and they were making trails and they put up bird feeders. So they reached out to find specs for bird houses um, and were asking information about feeders and, um, you know, were interested. I think they were going to also make a list of the wildlife that was at their site. So all of those things are really exciting to me because a lot of our, well, our education programs are very place-based. So I loved the idea that they were really focusing on their school and that area around their school to make it more attractive to wildlife. So I think that's an awesome way to get involved. And I know some preschool classes who have participated in um, Feeder Watch. So that's another one, kind of like the uh, Great Backyard Bird Count, but because they had one feeder, it was very easy for them to spend just a few minutes watching the birds that came to that feeder and recording those sightings. So there's lots of community science projects um, if you're not feeling up to, it, if it feels um, more doable to look for one particular species, there's quite a few community science projects that are focused on a particular species, um, like Climate Watch, um, although that one has you out hiking around and searching a whole area. But so those are options too. There's also iNaturalist, which is a, it's like eBird, but for everything and, and anybody could do that. But students could collect natural history sightings from their yard through their schoolyard or from anywhere around throughout the year. Um, the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas gets records from iNaturalists. So if you happen to see 
frogs or salamanders as they start waking up in the winter, in the spring, um, and submitted that through iNaturalist that would also be helping a local um, project that's going on. And I saw a question in the chat. Um, someone was asking if there are snowy owls at Dead Creek now. And so I was just taking a look on the Audubon bird app to see what the sightings were currently for snowy owls and I'm not seeing any there right now. Um, so that's and that's the data from from eBird. Um, I don't know if anybody else has seen snowy owls down there recently, but um, not, not nothing is showing up on <laughs> from what I'm looking. I've been down there to see the short-eared owls, which short -eared. Are, are really fun to see. You can see them. Last time I saw them was off of Gage Road. And, oh, yeah, um, you mentioned that. And that's fun to see short-eared owls, which are also not that common. And do they show up here when you say not that common, but like what's their well, pattern of? This year up? there were more than normal. So one time when we were there, somebody counted seven at one time. Um, and you just don't normally see that every year. Maybe one. They're so beautiful. Look at that. And they, they have really long wings. So when they fly, they look a little bit different than other, other owls when they're flying. <laughs> and Those are very short ears. I mean, they're, they're obviously they're not ears, but like thinking about the <laughs> great horned owl, it looks nothing like a great horned owl. So there's there's a picture of a short-eared owl in flight. It is very dramatic. And the best time to see them is, is at dusk when they're flying around. And they look at you. Maybe other owls do that too, but I feel like they really, they'll turn their head and look at you. Huh. I had a funny experience with a short-eared owl. When I first moved to Vermont, I was doing participating in the Plainfield Christmas bird count. And I didn't, I heard something in the bushes and I walked towards it and I was like scanning and scanning and standing there. Um, and then actually I was with Chip Darmstadt from the North Branch Nature Center. And he was like, don't move. <laughs> and it was like so perfectly camouflaged in this tree, like right in front of me. Um, it was just so like, if he hadn't said anything, I never would have known that there was an owl like hanging out <laughs> right in front of me. And you heard it, so I'm playing some short-eared owl barks and screams. So I'm noticing we're getting close to the end of the hour, so if you have your questions, feel free to Pop them in the chat here. Um, yeah, so the snowy owl in Shelburne, there was a sighting mid-January. Of course, there's the famous snowy owl that's in Burlington um, right now that seems like lots of folks are going out and trying to see. Um, and on eBird, it looks like someone reported a snowy owl sighting um, in Lamoille. Um, so they, they're around. Um, so the one in um, Burlington, I know, was getting, there were a lot of pressure of a lot of people trying to see it. So just remember that you're going to be a good um, wild animal steward and keep your distance. If the animal seems like it's changing its behavior, that's a sign that you're too close. If it looks uncomfortable or anxious, that's a sign that you're too close. So take your binoculars, <laughs> give it some space. Um, if it seems like there's a lot of other people there, you know, like pick a different time. Um, but a stressed animal, you know, it'll change its behavior if it's stressed, like all wild animals. So um, be a good, a good birder if you're trying to go out and see it. I'm noticing on eBird that the, um, the most recent sighting of, of snowy owls is in Morristown on Stancliffe Road. Wow, someone saw a gyre falcon. Gyre falcon in Shelburne to <laughs> Ferrisburg seen three weeks ago. Hmm, I'll, I'll bring that up for folks to look at. Pretty exciting. I know a couple of years ago there was a lot of excitement um, because there were golden eagles <laughs> in the uh, 
Marshfield area. Peter, were you the one that saw it or did you hear about it? Uh, when we had several friends report this sighting, uh, once in Shelburne and then again in North Ferrisburg, and we're assuming it's the same bird, but difficult to know. <laughs> but it's not unusual. They seem to be almost annual sightings. Um, again, when food sources are stressed in the north, they come farther south. So it's a rare treat, but they're around. Yeah, that's really very cool. We're the, yeah, the southern edge of their, oh yeah, on that range map, of their uncommon grounds. So one of those get lucky. Um, way, way up in the north there. That would be one too, where I hope they reported it to either eBird or iNaturalist. That data gets used um, by scientists and researchers. So it's important to, to be able to post and share that. Yeah, it's been logged in, thanks. And I see they mostly eat ptarmigans. <laughs> yeah, we have plenty of those in my feeder. <laughs> uh, in Putney, Vermont, there had been or have been many sightings of a leucistic um, red-tailed hawk, and that's the first I'd ever heard of it. So they've been posting photos, and I've tried to to see it, but I have not succeeded yet. So people are excited about it. Yeah, so if folks have never heard that word leucistic before, um, it is when an organism, um, it almost can look albino, although they're not true albino, so they'll have atypical coloring, usually white patches. Um, we get reports in from Burlington of a leucistic pigeon, and <laughs> lots of people see it, and so lots of people, it just stands out, so lots of people call us to tell us about it. I've seen photos of leucistic crows. So obviously that crow stands out <laughs> as being very different. But it's just one of those genetic things that pops up in a population. Yeah, this particular red tail has only, uh, it looks like only one red feather in its tail and all the rest of it is white. <laughs> That's really beautiful. Oh yeah. He's in the images here. Well, in our last minute here, I want to um, thank you all for hanging in there as I try to understand why no one got the link, <laughs> but I appreciate you joining us and bringing some questions. Um, I am gonna, I've captured the resources that have been shared. So I'm gonna, I'll just send those out so you can have them too if you didn't catch everything from the chat today. Um, and the Great Backyard Bird Count is just around the corner. It's this coming weekend. Starting Friday. So it's a great opportunity to get out and go birding and enjoy the snow while we have it. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.